I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son I of God. I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. That guy's good. It is no longer... All right, welcome, YouTube. Uh, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let's just ask him to help us, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word, for your son, for your spirit. And we pray that um, all of these things we just thank you for would be powerfully at work in our hearts now. Lord, we cannot do anything on our own strength. And so we turn to you in helplessness and pray that you would work, O oh God, in our hearts. In the Lord Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, I don't know if you've watched Lord of the Rings or read Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, but there's a character in the story named Wormtongue, and he is a sick kind of fellow. And he spends his life with his mouth right next to the king's ear. The king's name is Theoden. And Wormtongue is always in the king's ear whispering. And whatever the king sees or hears, Wormtongue just puts a little twist on it. Or he casts a little doubt about it. He undermines it. He turns it. He speaks in half-truths. You see, Wormtongue is poisoning the king with his words and with his lies. Positionally, Theoden is still the king. Positionally. Officially. But practically, he's not acting like a king. Positionally, he's a king, but practically, he is not fit to reign. He, he can't rule. He can't think straight. He is, he's paralyzed by what? by the lies spoken to him by Wormtongue. And it's not until Gandalf, the wizard, comes and, uh, and speaks the truth, you know, with, with power and with force, that finally King Theoden wakes up and is able to become the king that he's supposed to be. And as I think about that story, I think about our lives as Christians. We too have someone that we could call worm tongue in our lives. And he loves to spend his days with his mouth right beside our ears, whispering to us, speaking lies to us. And, you know, all of us, if we believe in Christ, we are Christians positionally. That never changes. A child of God is a child of God forever. But what this enemy of ours wants to do is to paralyze us, to make us so we can't think straight, to make us so we can't enjoy our relationship with God, to make us so that we're, we're not able to serve and, and live the way that we were meant to live. And how does he do it? He does it by his lies. And so this series, I want to talk to you about five lies that Satan, because that's who I'm talking about, Five lies that Satan wants you to believe are true. And we're going to look at lies like, you know, God loves you, but he doesn't really like you. Um, the last night, we're going to talk about this lie, <clears throat> and it goes like this. He says, Christian, it's sinful for you to enjoy God's creation gifts. And he wants to make you feel guilty about things that God doesn't want you to feel guilty about. So we're going to look through all these lies. But the lie that Satan was whispering into the ears of the Galatians who Paul wrote to, was this. And he whispers it to you and to me too. Lie number one in our series is this. Congratulations, Christians. You no longer need the gospel. That's what he wants to convince you. He wants you to believe this is true. He puts it into your ear. Congratulations, Christian. You no longer need the gospel. 
You see, the devil comes to you with a, with a diploma and he says, you've graduated. You've graduated. You needed the gospel when you were unsaved. And you found out that you were a guilty sinner who had crossed God. And you found out that if you died, you would be cast away from God's presence forever. And you needed a savior. You needed Jesus Christ to come and save you and forgive your sins and put you on the path to heaven. But now that you're a Christian, you no longer need the gospel. He says, now that you're a Christian, the gospel will only be something that other people need, not that what you need. I wonder how you're hearing this so far. Maybe you're hearing it this way. Maybe you're thinking, you're right, Mike. We need to have a weekly gospel meeting so that the gospel can go out. And I, I applaud that. We need to have a gospel outreach in our churches, but that's not what I mean. I don't mean that you need to keep having gospel outreach. That's not what I'm talking about. You say, well, you're absolutely right, Mike. It's good for Christians to come to the gospel meeting and, and have our hearts warmed by the old, old story of the gospel. That's true. I agree with you, but that's not what I mean. I mean that you and I need to live by the gospel. That the gospel is not just the way we get saved, but the gospel is the way we live our Christian lives. And what Satan, what his lie would be to you is, oh, the gospel is the ABCs. And as soon as you're a Christian, you can leave it behind. But as men like Tim Keller would say, actually the gospel is the A to Z. So we're going to see, <clears throat> we're going to see here in this passage that the gospel is for life. That the good news that Jesus loved you and died for you and rose again for you, the good news that saved you when you were an unbeliever on your way to hell is just as good news for you as a believer today. The truth is the gospel is for life. And so this is how we're going to um, see this, brothers and sisters. We're going to go through this passage. We're going to see three things. And if you can see these three things, you'll understand how to fight the lie. You'll understand how to argue back to the devil who will say, oh, the gospel is no longer relevant to you. That's for unbelievers. You'll know how to argue back to him because we're going to see three things. Number one, even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. Even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. And then we're going to see even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. And then finally, we're going to see that even the best of Christians must live by believing the gospel. So let's start with that first one, verses 11 to 14. Even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. Just look at verses 11 to 14 with me. Paul is speaking of this time in Antioch when Peter showed up. And Peter was there, and um, someone has said that Antioch was like a laboratory for the church because it was the first church where Christians who were Jews mixed with Christians who were Gentiles. And they, they mixed together. They actually worshiped together. They ate together. They lived together. This was like a first laboratory because if you know anything about the Gentiles and the Jews, you know that those two don't always mix, right? The Jews had their law and their religion, and sometimes they could be guilty of pride as they looked down at the filthy Gentiles. And meanwhile, the Gentiles could look up at the Jews and, and, and hate them in their hearts because they had all this religion and they, they thought they were so special. And, and so there was this hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles, but here in Antioch, for the first time, these Christians from different backgrounds began to mix together and to eat together. You know, the Jews, they had grown up with the Old Testament law. And the Old Testament law taught them to follow a very special diet. And there were foods that were clean and unclean. And the purpose of that diet was to teach the people about the holiness of God. But when Jesus Christ died and rose again and brought the gospel to this world, the Lord Jesus broke down the law. 
the wall that separated Jews and Gentiles. And he showed to Peter that these dietary laws about this food is clean, that food isn't, that these laws are abolished. So that Jewish Christians who believed in Christ could now eat whatever they wanted. They didn't have to follow those old dietary laws anymore. And what that did was it opened up the possibility of Jews and Gentiles finally being able to eat together. Do you know what happened? What happened is, is that some visitors came from Jerusalem and they visited Antioch and they saw what was happening. They saw that Peter, the apostle, was no longer obeying these old food laws <clears throat> and that he was eating, <clears throat> excuse me, unclean foods with, with all the Jews and all the Gentiles. And they maybe looked sternly upon this. And Peter, he began to fear their influence. And he began to pull away from the Gentile Christians in the church. And he began to once again <clears throat> separate himself from Gentiles and, and to go back under the law and, and restrict the foods he ate and the people he ate with. <clears throat> and Paul sees this and confronts him. It says, verse 11, I opposed him to his face. Why? <clears throat> because, <clears throat> verse 14, so Paul says, I saw that their conduct was not in step with what? <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. I saw that their conduct was not in step with the commandments. Is that what he says? I saw that their conduct was not in keeping with the teachings. Is that what he said? No. He said, I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Why? Because even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. Who is the man Paul finds guilty of living as if the gospel isn't true? It's not you or me. It's not some little Christian like you and me. Who is it? It's Peter. Peter, the apostle, one of the inner three. <clears throat> the very man that God chose to send an angel to and a voice from heaven and a special vision <clears throat> to tell him that the Old Testament food laws are gone so that he could go to Cornelius and bring him the gospel. It is this man, the very best of Christians, who begins to live as if the gospel isn't true. You see, you see, <clears throat> when Peter was asked to preach the gospel at the church, he would get up and he would preach the same thing he always preached. Nothing had changed in his message. He preached, you're sinners, all of you. None of us can earn our way back to God. Only through the death and resurrection of Christ can you and I be saved and forgiven and made right with God. You must simply trust in Jesus and be saved. He preached the same right, correct gospel message every time he got up to speak. But by his life, he was preaching another message. When Peter pulled away from the Gentile Christians and restricted himself to the Jewish Christians, when Peter went back under the Old Testament law and said, okay, I won't eat pork and I won't eat with these people, do you know what he was communicating by his life? He was communicating to all the Gentiles, if you really want to be saved, if you really want to be fully accepted by God, and if you really want to be fully part of God's people, you need something more than faith in Jesus Christ. You need the works of the law. Huh? He would never have said that with his lips. He would never have been caught dead preaching that from the pulpit. Never. But he was preaching it by his life. He was saying, there's an in and there's an out. And until you boys, you Gentiles, begin to eat like me and wash like me and obey the law like me, you can't really be part of us. And Paul said, I condemned him. I, 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 I confronted him. I corrected him because he wasn't acting in step with the truth of the gospel because even the best of Christians 
can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. So brothers and sisters, let's leave Antioch and Galatia and let's come to Porters of Prairie. Let's come to the person sitting in your chair. Is there a way in which in your head you know and understand and believe the truth of the gospel, but in your heart and in your life, you're beginning to live as if the gospel isn't true. I have. I'm telling you I'm going to go through five lies. Guess how many of them Satan has tricked me with? All five. I am 0 for 5 at avoiding these lies. He has tripped me up time and time again. He has paralyzed me. He has robbed this Christian of his joy so many times because of these lies. And so let me just give you an idea of what this can look like in my life. When I come to church Sunday morning, <clears throat> instead of looking to Jesus Christ and his perfect work as what gives me confidence to come into the presence of God, I can instead begin to look at how early I woke up. Did I wake up in time to have a quiet time? How did I do this week at praying and reading my Bible? When was the last time I witnessed to someone and shared my faith? When was the last time I gave a tract? Was I organized enough to go to the bank and get some money out to give a donation and be generous? How long has it been since I last committed that sin? How thankful do I feel in my heart? And if I'm doing well in all those things, I can come with confidence. Oh, I rocked it this week, right? Uh, all pistons firing in my Christian life. I'm, And I can come with confidence before God because I've lived such an amazing life. But guess what? More often than not, I didn't fire on all cylinders well. And you see what's happening, brothers and sisters? In my head, I would tell you, if I was evangelizing, I would tell you, listen, sinner, you can only be saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's faith in Christ plus nothing. You can't add anything by your works. But in my heart, I've begun to live as if the gospel isn't true. I've begun to live as if, actually, God will only really love me. He'll only really accept me. If in addition to Christ's work, I also add my works. Even the best of Christians, even the Apostle Peter, can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. Well, number two, even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. Even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. You see, well, let me put it to you this way. <clears throat> Imagine that you saw two men, and they were really going at it. You know, they were really exchanging heated words with each other. And you you came, I mean, this, this is very interesting, right? Like, what are they on about? And so you come a little closer, and you see, oh, it's the Apostle Paul. And he keeps doing this to the Apostle Peter. He's really given it to him. And you think, oh, what, what's Paul correcting a Peter for? You know, this could be very interesting. Maybe Peter misunderstood, you know, uh, the order of events in the coming days. Maybe he got the tribulation in the wrong place. Or maybe he doesn't understand the coming of the Lord. Or maybe he doesn't understand how the seven feasts of Jehovah link up with the seven parables of the kingdom and the seven churches of Asia. You know, um, if, if none of this makes any sense to you, don't worry. I'm just trying to say... If the Apostle Paul was going to correct Peter, it would have to be something very complicated, right? But as you draw near and overhear what Paul is speaking so forcefully to Peter, you are shocked. Because he's not saying, Peter, we're dispensationalists. You know, none, none of this covenant theology. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, Peter, we're all sinners. None of us can be saved by our works. Only by faith in Christ can we be saved. Do you see? You see that this is what Paul does in verses 
15 to 16. He says, Peter, we're Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, you know, yet we know that none of us is justified by works of the law, but only through faith in Christ. We also have believed in Christ to be justified by faith in Christ, but not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Is, am I the only one who finds it shocking that as we begin to eavesdrop on this conversation between Paul and Peter, Paul is not correcting him on some very complicated piece of theology. But Paul is forcefully reminding Peter of the very simple truths of the gospel. You see, even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. Satan would say, the gospel is for six-year-olds who aren't saved yet. The gospel is for 32-year-olds who are living in sin. But Paul says, the gospel is for even the best of Christians. We all need forceful reminders. Why do we need? You know, Martin Luther, he said, he said something like this. He said, we need the gospel beaten into our heads. Do you know why? Because the gospel teaches something that goes completely contrary to our nature. The gospel teaches something that is unique in this world. It's this. You and I are sinners, and the only way we can be saved is by grace. We cannot earn God's love. We cannot perform really, really well so that he loves us and likes us and smiles. We can't, we can't, we can't. And the only way to be right with him is if he gives it to us by grace. The only thing we can do is not to give anything, but just to receive it by faith in the Lord. You and I, if you're a Christian, you understood this the night or day you got saved. But as soon as we get saved, we can start to default back to the old way of living where we try once again to earn God's favor by our contributions and works. It's a contrary way of thinking. It's the very opposite of what we normally encounter in daily life. It's actually the very opposite of the way we treat other people. It's always a, you be good to me, then I'll respond and good to you. And so we think, well, this must be how God is with us. And, you know, if I, if I didn't wake up in time to have a quiet time, if I wasn't organized enough to have money to give, if I haven't been helping with gospel outreach, if, if that sin in my life, I just did it last night, then surely he will not want to see me today until I can make up for it with lots and lots of good Christian things. And we forget that the gospel is true. So let me just give you an illustration and we'll move on to the final point here. But there's a man named Michael Reeves and he was driving somewhere to teach truths similar to what I'm teaching you right now. <clears throat> and he's driving down the road fairly early in the morning, heading off to speak to all these young people about the gospel, when he realized, oh no, I forgot to have my quiet time today. I forgot to open God's word and pray. And then he thought, God will not help me. The Lord is not with me. I'm all on my own. I'm supposed to go and teach these kids about Christ, and, and I failed to have my quiet time. Oh, no. And he was locked in guilt. You see, Satan was there, right? Right in his ear, saying, you, you moron, you loser, you pathetic Christian. How will God love you now when you've neglected his word? Finally, Michael Reeves pulled the car over onto the side of the road, and do you know what he did? He looked himself in the eye, as it were, and he said, Reeves, you moron! You moron! Have you forgotten the truth of the gospel? Like, if all it took was a quiet time to make God happy with me, Jesus wouldn't have had to have died. Reeves, you moron! You see, even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. And you and I need to learn to do this to ourselves when Satan puts these silly little lies in our hearts and says, God's love for you depends on how well you're obeying. 
then, then we need to do this to ourselves. We need to say, Knox, you moron, you idiot. You've forgotten the truth of the gospel. Did you get saved by having a quiet time? No, you got saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And when you were a nasty little sinner, he loved you enough to die for you. Do you think he loves you less now? You see, this is how we live by the truth of the gospel. We need to do that to ourselves, but we also need to meet in the church and hear it spoken to us from others, which is what I'm trying to do for you right now. If you're here, insecure about whether God loves you, embroiled in guilt because your life has not been as shiny as it should be for Christ, then I am speaking the truth to you forcefully. God's love for you is not dependent. His acceptance of you is not based on how faithful were you with your devotions this week. His love for you is based on the work of Christ. And he accepts you by faith in him. And so even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. Even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. Let's just close with our third one, verses 17 to 21. Even the best of Christians must live by believing the gospel. Just look at verse 17. Here, Paul acknowledges that when he goes around preaching this message that sinners can be justified by faith in Christ alone, not faith plus works, but by faith in Christ alone. Paul says, I know that when I go around preaching this message, there's this, there's this opposition. Um, there's this pushback that goes like this. Paul, if that was true, if it was true that people are justified simply by trusting in Christ and not by works, if it's true that people can know they're going to heaven, no matter how they live, simply on Christ's work alone, then what's to stop all these Christians of yours from just living any old way life of sin they want, right? I mean, if I knew that I was going to heaven by grace and it's not by my works, why should I not just sin as much as I want? And so um, Paul says, he voices this objection. He says, is Christ then, verse 17b, is Christ then a servant of sin? Is he a promoter of sin? Absolutely not, Paul says. He says, actually, do you know who the real sinner is? Verse 18. The real sinner would be me, the apostle Paul, who went around telling everyone that the law is over. Now, if I was to start bringing back the law and telling Gentiles they need to obey the law in order to be saved, then I would be the transgressor. This is Paul's nice way of saying, Peter, actually, you're the transgressor. Peter was the one that did this, right? He was bringing back the law. Peter had torn down the law and said, Cornelius, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. You'll be one of us. And now Peter is, by his life, suggesting, uh, um, hinting, implying to the Gentiles that they do need to obey the law. It is faith plus works to really be included. And Paul says, look, Peter, um, that's what true transgression is. Do you think God's happy with what's happening in Antioch right now? Do you think God's happy what, looking at all his Gentile people and they're feeling like they're not included, that they have to add something to their salvation? Do you, you're the transgressor, Peter. And then he says, verse 19, Paul says, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. He says, he says Peter, I actually had to get out of my relationship with the law in order to even begin to live for God. We'll talk about why that's so tomorrow a little bit. But now he comes to verse 20, and this is where I want us to end up. Paul says, and he's speaking in verse 20 as a representative Christian. He's speaking the kinds of things that he wants all of us to learn to say with him. He's saying, I have been crucified with Christ, which means the law can't get me anymore. I'm crucified. It's over. My punishment is gone. It's done. And then he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've got a new power at work in my life. It's Jesus Christ. He's invaded my life and taken over. And then he says, finally, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, do you see what that means? It means that even the best of Christians must live 
by faith in the gospel. See what Paul says? He says, here I am, the apostle Paul. Who has planted more churches than I have, you know? Who has been a more successful, fervent lover of Christ than me? Do you want to know the secret to my Christian life, Paul says? It's this, every day I wake up and I believe it all over again. Believe what? The gospel. What gospel? The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That is the secret of Paul's Christian life. Even the best of Christians can begin to live as if the gospel isn't true. You can begin to live as if your relationship with God and his acceptance of you and his love for you is dependent on your faith in Christ plus your works. Even the best of Christians needs forceful reminders of the truth of the gospel. This is why we have church. We come every week, and all week long, maybe we've been going on default mode, thinking, oh yeah, it's all on me, and I haven't been doing too good. And the preacher gets up, or a brother gets up and gives it a hymn, or someone prays a prayer, or someone speaks to you with a cup of coffee in their hand, and they tell you the truth forcefully. They say, Reeves, you moron! You've forgotten the truth of the gospel. You're not saved by your good works. You're saved by Christ. Of course he loves you even though you've sinned. He loved you enough when you were a sinner to die for you. Do you think he's loved you less, loves you less now? You see? Force for minus the truth of the gospel. And finally, even the best of Christians must live by faith in the gospel. You know, when I say that, when I say that last line about even the best of Christians must live by faith in the gospel, what do I really mean? Who is the gospel? It's Jesus Christ, right? When I say that, what I mean is this. Even the best of Christians must live his or her daily life trusting in Christ. The gospel was not just good news for you when you were scared of dying and going into eternity in your sins. The gospel meets you, dear Christian, right now as good news. Satan wants you to think this, that God had good news for you when you were in your sins, but now that you're saved, you're on your own. Now it's up to you. Now it's the law. Now it's a checklist. Now it's perform, 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 give, 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 evangelize, evangelize, pray, 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 lots and lots of stuff, and then maybe you'll make it. But, but the fruit of Christianity does not grow in the soil of works righteousness. The fruit of Christianity does not grow in the soil of law and self-performance. The fruit of Christianity grows in the soil of you and I resting in the truth and knowing the truth that my Jesus loves me, that he died for me, that he gave himself for me. The lie is you no longer need the gospel. The truth is the gospel is for life. Never graduate from the gospel. Never think that it's passe and done with. I don't care if you're 83 or 43 or 23 or 13 or whatever. I don't care. I'm six, I was six years old when I got saved. Now I'm 42. And 36 years later, I need the gospel, the good news that Jesus loved me and died for me. I need that gospel just as much today as I did 36 years ago. We not only enter Christianity by the gospel, we progress by the gospel. We don't only get in by the gospel, but we get on by the gospel. We make progress by it. So, brothers and sisters, enjoy the freedom right now. Apply this to your heart. Go home today and just believe the gospel. That is the way to make progress as a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel and that it is good news, not just for non-Christians, but that it is such good news for us Christians as well. And I pray that you will help us all to fight the lie of the devil by this straight shooting truth from Paul in this passage. And we pray that um, 
uh, our churches would not be a culture of people trying to earn your favor, but would rather be a culture of enjoying your favor by grace, and that that would be the thing that radically transforms us into life, lives of obedience and zealous good works for you. Uh, Lord, just set us all free by this wonderful truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock, we're going to look at line number two, and then we're going to do it all over again Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. If the Lord doesn't come, I'd love it if you could join us on YouTube or in person as often as you can. Thank you for coming.